On va passer maintenant euh, à Angel. And I'm going to switch to English because Angel uh, comes to us from the Netherlands. Uh, and his presentation is entitled I noticed that they all try mighty hard to take their misery in a mansion. Young women facing wealth and poverty uh, in the Victorian no. era. Yes, please. Uh, Angel is a research master's student in literary studies at Leiden University in the Netherlands. He has a background in cultural analysis and in Dutch and American studies and literature. Oops, sorry. He has written critically about the neoliberal narrative of lifestyle minimalism and is currently writing his thesis on literary depictions of shopping. His research interests are eco-criticism, neoliberal studies, and less abstractly, the question of how should we live on this burning, unjust planet? Whenever you're ready. Uh, is this on? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I should have prepared a speech like everyone else has. I haven't, so uh, regrets are abundant. <laughs> uh, now... We're switching gears from what I understood of the previous presentation, which was not very much. Uh, and we are moving on to uh, literature, which is my field. Let me just set the time so I don't speak forever. All right. Um, so what I'm interested in here is wealth and poverty, which could be seen as the public, the social faces of scarcity and abundance. Um, how wealth and poverty relate to literary things is actually my topic. Uh, <clears throat> we'll survive. <laughs> okay, so my when I made this presentation, I really emphasized uh, wealth and poverty, but what I'm actually interested in is material things and how they are depicted in literary texts. So what are literary things? Well, what I consider to be literary things are objects, man-made objects depicted in texts. Uh, I'm especially interested in novels because they were the most popular form of entertainment or literary entertainment in the 19th century. And I'm especially interested in the 19th century because it was a period of great social change and because it set the basis for society as we know it today. So uh, industrialization, of course, took root and industrial capitalism also was established. Um, <coughs> industrialization meant two things that I'm interested in. Uh, first of all, people flocked to cities from the countryside because working in factories was uh, what made money uh, for the working class and it was not really sustainable to live rural existences anymore. And uh, factories meant that goods were a lot more accessible, a lot more plentiful uh, and this is reflected in the culture uh, of the 19th century. So uh, in the homes of people, more and more objects started accumulating and it started making sense even for the poor to buy things that previously they would have made themselves uh, because putting all their time in working and earning wages was just more efficient. Uh, now, a terminological note, uh, here I will say things a lot. Uh, I could also say objects, I could perhaps say commodities. Um, a lot of scholars who have thought about these issues much deeper than I have uh, put distinctions uh, amongst these terms. Uh, for example, as we will see later, things are seen as uh, independent and objects are seen as more tame uh, by thinkers like Martin Heidegger and Bill Brown. Uh, but for now, for ease of talking about these topics, I will just use them as synonyms. Uh, now, 
I am not going to talk about all of 19th century literature because that's impossible. Uh, I will be focusing mostly on these two novels. Uh, one is North and South, an English novel by Elizabeth Gaskell, published in 1855, and the other is Sister Carrie by Theodore Dreiser, uh, published in 1900, but set some 10 years earlier. Uh, the distance in time, the 50 years that go between these two texts, are not as jarring as they might seem, because industrialization really took root in the US a bit later, so they are kind of equally spaced to the peak of industrial production in the relative uh, country. And both of these are realist texts. Uh, specifically, North and South is a condition of England novel, which means that it is a novel that is deeply concerned with the social differences and the social clashes that happened in, a, in an industrializing country where some people worked really hard jobs the whole day and uh, just to line the pockets of their employers and where their employers just look down on their employees thinking that they were dumb and worthless and just worth exploiting. Sister Carrie, on the other hand, is a naturalist novel, which means basically that Dreiser attempted to depict uh, society and life as it really is. Of course, you know, th this doesn't mean that he succeeded, but that was his goal. And that caused quite a bit of a stir because uh, in Sister Carrie, uh, it depicts extramarital affairs and uh, the protagonist uh, having relationships with men without being married to them. Uh, and Dreiser doesn't really pass judgment on this, which at the time was kind of unthinkable. Uh, the reason why I picked these two novels specifically is because they share two important traits. Uh, one of Both of them have young female protagonists who are on the move, both geographically and along the social ladder. Uh, Margaret uh, from North and South uh, starts out in London living with her wealthy aunt. Then she moves to Helstone, which is a very small village where her parents live, her dad, well, her father, uh, working as a clergyman. Then her father loses his faith or really his conviction so he feels like he cannot do the job anymore and moves to Milton which is a fictionalized version of Manchester uh, to work as a private tutor which was a socially much less prestigious position. Uh, so and then uh, Carrie uh, goes from Columbia City a very small town to Chicago to New York. Uh, when she moves to Chicago, she's going to live with her sister and realizes that a working class existence is not what she wants. It is dreary, it, is, it has very few satisfactions and uh, so she decides to um, have relationships with two men in succession uh, that will allow her a much more lavish lifestyle without having to spend time in factories. So these, both of these characters see various levels of society. They start middle class, they see uh, much more difficult conditions, and then by the end of the book, both of them become quite wealthy. Margaret because she inherits, and Carrie because she becomes a very famous actress. Uh, Another um, reason why class is important and so social certification is important in these texts is because, uh, as I said, in the 19th century, plenty of people flocked from the countryside to cities, and that meant that cities became even more crowded than they already were. And in the compressed space of a city, you... Um, you can't really avoid people who are from a different social class than you. You're going to meet them on the street. You might even live on nearby buildings. And so the impact of the very stratified society of the 19th century was especially visible in 
uh, in urban settings, and urban settings are the background of both these texts. Now, as I said, my question is, what role do material things play in these texts? I have tried to delineate some um, functions, and the first one is rather obvious. Uh, things act sometimes as backgrounds. So in the first quote, um, there, it's a description of uh, Carrie's sister's house. Uh, the walls of the room were discordantly papered, the floors were covered with matting, and the hole laid with a thin rag carpet. Um, Carrie only knew that these things to her were dull and commonplace. Whereas, uh, the second quote is a description of the sitting room of uh, Margaret's parents once they moved to Milton. Uh, they don't have mirrors, um, a warm, sober breath of coloring, uh, dear old hellstone chintz curtains and chair covers, white china vase filled with unassuming plants. So what these descriptions give is kind of an affective, almost bodily sense of what it feels like to be in these spaces. Um, these, these things are not really important on their own. They are important in how they communicate an atmosphere altogether. Uh, one of the most important critics of uh, things in literature is Ellen Friedgood, who wrote a book called The Ideas in Things. And she thought that this type of use for things is not really worth thinking about too much because things are just um, are flat. There is no depth to them. Uh, and instead she advocated for just choosing one object, one that comes up more and more times in a text, for example, and then investigating its life outside of the text. So how was it produced, how was it used, how was it sold, or what kind of people had this type of object in their home, and then from this historical research, then bring it back to the text and see how it changes the interpretation. But I think that uh, one just has to um, at least acknowledge this very basic function, because it it gives information to the reader about what type of space the character is in and what type of people inhabit uh, this space. So it is a very compact way of giving a lot of intuitive information. Things are also useful in mediating or representing characters' social relations. Uh, the first example I have is from North and South. Uh, Margaret makes friends with a working class uh, girl, Bessie Higgins, who is sickly uh, because she got a uh, brown lung from working at a factory and breathing in uh, cotton fluff. Uh, they, again, they become friends and then Bessie dies from her illness and uh, Margaret gifts a nightcap to put on her for when she's going to be buried. And then by the end of the book, when uh, Margaret is about to leave uh, Milton, she goes over to the Higginses and asks for a little trinket to remember her friend by. And she gets, uh, she chooses a drinking cup, a very cheap object um, that is, shows that she's considerate towards the economic situation of the Higginses. Uh, but also the fact that these very unassuming objects are, are exchanged among them show that the relationship is genuine. Just because they're from different social classes doesn't mean that one is taking advantage of the other or that the other feels necessarily pity, but they are equals on some level. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is, uh, in Sister Carrie, the question of attraction is really important. And in this scene, uh, Carrie meets the, her first partner, her first boyfriend, on the train that's taking her to Chicago for the first time. Uh, and she is attracted by what he's wearing. So he's wearing this very flashy, uh, very expensive looking outfit, which as we learn later, 
is not really what wealthy people would wear, but to her uh, naive countryside girl, this means that he's, uh, he occupies a higher social position than her by him. And she starts questioning what she, she herself is wearing in comparison. So in this case, things uh, show and mediate friendship and cause or make it easier for characters to be attracted to one another. Uh, things also have an active role sometimes. Uh, they motivate characters' actions and they push the plot forward. So as I mentioned, uh, there's uh, some critics operate a distinction between things and objects where, yes, where things are um, active and have agency and objects don't. And indeed, here we can speak about things proper. Uh, the quote that I've chosen has, uh, is a reflection on what it means to spend time in the atmosphere of the wealthy. Uh, so in the uh, walking along the magnific magnificent red residences, splendid equipages, gilded shops, restaurants, resorts of all kinds, flowers, silks and wines. And all this wealth acts, according to Dreiser, on a person's soul as a chemical reagent. A craving is set up, which, if gratified, shall eternally result in dreams and death. So these objects are not... Uh, it is not people who have control over how these object, objects impact them, but people are passive. They are, they are powerless against the seductive power of these things. And again, these things tend to be all combined together into an atmosphere. Uh, things are also important as commodities because, as I said, the 19th century was a period of great um, social change and uh, with industrialization came a need to um, plan what was produced and in order to plan it efficiently you need to make sure that what you make will be sold and in order to do that a science of marketing was developed. Um, so things became produced with the idea of not only t of selling them to people, but of selling them to people who wouldn't necessarily have thought they needed them, right? So it becomes more and more important to set up systems that convince people that they want more and more things. Uh, and in the first example, uh, it is set in a, a department store and we can see Carrie who looks at all the goods set up there and she she's just craving everything that she sees because everything is you know there are earrings there are bracelets there are pins there are chains uh they are frilly little things that nobody really needs but they are things that everyone exposed to them is going to want so the department store uh is born as a place to set up cravings in order to sell the things that have been produced and if they are not sold that's a big problem. Uh, in Gaskell uh, commodities don't show up nearly as much however um, again we're back with Bessie. Uh, she, she looks at Margaret and she's concerned that she's not going to look very nice for a fancy dinner that she has organized because Margaret at the time is wearing a print gown, which her Milton's eyes appraised as seven pence a yard. So the uh, material of uh, Margaret's dress is something that Bessie knows intimately because she might have made it or she has made similar things and she's able to put a price on them. And this mechanism of Putting a price on things is what characterizes commodities because commodities are objects that are made for exchange or that are characterized by their exchange value. Um, and so in writing about things as commodities, uh, writers can reflect 
on the social and economic changes that have faced their, uh, that characterize their time. Uh, just to conclude, so all these uh, functions of things are clearly not separate. They, are, they work together and they're really hard to identify. But my point is that looking at just one or two functions, as some of these authors do, uh, doesn't offer a complete picture because it's always going to leave something out. And I think even though it is much harder, it is worthwhile trying to find and develop a framework to think about all these functions together. Thank you.